on your way to work tomorrow, instead of sitting around with your finger up your ass, look around. There's a union out there called Ask Me, and they're busting their balls for you doing a lot of shit work you take for granted. For example, we pick up your fucking garbage. We got broads out there who keep your kids from getting run over by some hard on. We plug up the holes in the road so you don't fuck up your car. And we push around a lot of little old ladies from Florida. We're out there zapping rats and roaches and, and making sure your kids don't drink piss from no fucking water fountains. We're fucking ass me. Uh, amalgamated federalization. Uh, hey, I don't know what the fuck it means. All I know is we're hard-working, tax-paying people like you, and we don't take shit from nobody. You got that, asshole? Ask me. The fucking union, it works for you. Welcome to the ninth episode of Franklin, the City Skyline series where I spend a week and a half watching Bongo Cat videos instead of making this video. The weekend, the eight hour day, lunch breaks, minimum wage. What do these things have in common? People had to die to get you those things. Through strikes, sit-ins, and other organized labor action, Labor won shorter hours, higher pay, and a whole extra holiday. By the way, stop honoring the damn veterans on Labor Day. They have their own day. Uh, Christ. Uh, this is the organized labor episode. Kind of like the liberalism episode, I'm going to do some generic building and talk at y'all. Since this game doesn't really have any kind of socioeconomic simulation, so I can't like simulate a general strike or even a riot or whatever uh so we're gonna start with some history of organized labor before capitalism talk about labor and capital uh, do an overview of how the national labor unions of the early 19th century relate to how unions work today and then talk about a specific strike event in Franklin in this era, which is well before Marx or the IWW or trade unions as we know them today. We're actually going to skip most of U.S. labor history entirely in this episode, since, well, I got a whole series to talk about that in. So uh, we're going to start with ancient history. It wasn't really labor, but it was organized. The first thing we could call a general strike happened in the Roman Republic, the Secessio Plebis, or rather the several of them. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce Latin. Please excuse my butchering of everything. So in the Roman Republic, which was the nominally democratic predecessor to the Roman Empire, there were two distinct social classes, the plebeians and the patricians. Patricians were said to be descendants of the first hundred Roman senators appointed by Romulus, who was the mythical founder of Rome, and they were almost always wealthy. Everyone else was a plebeian. Some plebeians were wealthy, but the vast majority were not. However, patricians could hold political office and could become Roman priests, uh, uh, plebeians could do neither of those things, no matter how rich they were. So this uh, this division led to the first Secessio Plebis in 494 BC. A huge number of plebeians were in a massive amount of debt to the patricians. After the patrician senate refused to pass debt reforms, the plebeians, as a class, picked up and left Rome to camp on the Mon Sasser, I don't know if that's how you pronounce that, which was north of the city. They uh, refused to come back until the patricians negotiated with them. 
the patricians knowing they'd been beat and they can't really you know do anything without the labor of the plebeians agreed to the appointment of plebeian tribunes which served as a plebeian check on patrician power uh, a few more of these occurred over time the second secessio plebis's aim was to restore the plebeian tribunes after they were suspended uh, it achieved the same and also finally got all of rome's laws put down in writing Previously, plebeians were expected to obey laws, but only patricians were allowed to know what those laws were. There were a couple more secessio plebises after that during the Roman Republic, uh, but their causes and effects were a little murkier, and in the Roman Empire, they didn't really happen at all. But uh, through the Roman Republic... To the Enlightenment, we have some things that kind of look like labor organizations, but uh, really aren't in the modern sense. Guilds. Uh, the Romans call them collegia. These were free associations of local tradesmen and merchants who banded together to protect and share trade secrets. So, you know, there'll be a blacksmith's guild, the silk weaver's guild, the Glaziers Guild, the Warcraft Guild, the EVE Online Guild, and so on. These free tradesmen would hire apprentices to pass on their crafts with the guarantee that these apprentices would eventually become master craftsmen or artisans like their employers. At the dawn of the Industrial Era, however, these guarantees became a little less secure. With the invention of large mechanized looms and spinning machines, more and more apprentices were taken on in the textile trades just to tend to the machinery rather than to learn the trades. Which is part of why organized labor couldn't really develop without the development of industrial capitalism. The employer-employee relationship we know today didn't really exist in a meaningful form before the development of large-scale industrialization. An artisan was usually just one guy, and that one guy owned his tools, he owned his shop, and he employed at most one or two apprentices, who he trained to become master craftsmen like himself, and he could expect to have similar levels of wealth. So, uh, we use the term Luddite today as a kind of slur. Oh, so you're against progress? Don't you know that every job automated results in a million billion new jobs? Don't you know this is a better way for the economy if we automate your job and take away your livelihood and leave you destitute and unable to feed your kids? Huh? Coal mining punk? Don't you want to learn to code? You'll be so employable at age 55 with beginner's knowledge of HTML, CSS, and MySQL in the bustling tech hub that is Shemokin, Pennsylvania, the Silicon Valley of Northumberland County. The Luddites were a group of skilled textile workers, that's, you know, tailors, weavers, and so on, in Nottingham in England in the early 19th century, who realized something odd was going on as more and more machinery appeared in their industry. Though their productivity was going up, or they could produce more goods in a set period of time, their pay was not. Furthermore, independent tailors and other skilled artisans could not afford machinery and thus could not compete on price with the new textile mills. Overall, skilled workers were being made increasingly redundant by machinery, which did not require the same level of skill to operate. So the Luddites took out their frustration through direct action. They smashed the machines and burned the mills which they couldn't compete with, and which were responsible for the reduction in their quality of life. Uh, mill owners, of course, returned fire. They personally shot Luddites, but the Luddites responded by assassinating mill owners and destroying their mills. The government responded too. Despite the ongoing Napoleonic Wars, the British government managed to spare enough soldiers to crush the Luddites, who had essentially managed to start a regional rebellion in Nottingham. Now, the uh, army had largely put down the Luddite movement by 1813, and in show trials, the government convicted most of their leaders, 
and some random folks who happen to be standing around and sentence them to penal transportation or execution. So the bulk of the Luddite movement was uh, active from around 1811 to 1816, well before Marx or Engels or any of the fancy theory guys do in theory. The Luddites simply recognized something fairly obvious about the capitalist system. The benefits from automation and labor-saving devices accrue only to the capitalist who owns the machinery, not to the workers who provide the labor which is being saved. The workers, particularly skilled workers whose labor would otherwise command a premium, quickly find themselves out of work or find their labor at least significantly devalued as automation creeps in. So the Luddites weren't opposed to machinery in and of itself. They just wanted higher pay for operating the machines and that machine operators would go through a proper apprenticeship as they did. Actually, let me repeat that. The Luddites were not opposed to technology. The Luddites were not opposed to technology. The Luddites weren't opposed to technology. They were opposed to how the benefits of the technology was distributed. And they weren't your model socialists either. Most Luddites were relatively well-off artisans and skilled workers who had benefited greatly from early capitalism and were just now feeling the pinch from automation. However, they did advance the idea of fair profit. That is, that the benefits of automation should be shared by all the people rather than primarily accrue to the capitalist who owns the mill. So you could say that they had a structural critique of capitalism then. What, what does this mean? Okay, so let's talk about the raw shields. You start in your asinine, edgy, high school, crypto-fascist phase, believing that a secret cabal of Jewish bankers control the economy, the media, and maybe also the weather, and they're the ones doing the imperialism and the war and the foreclosures and exploitation and all that. And if we just got rid of them, the world would be a better and happier place. So uh, eventually you get past that. You realize that was anti-Semitic and started thinking that instead of the raw shields, there's a cabal of multiracial and multi-ethnic capitalists who control the economy, the media, and also maybe the weather. And they're the ones doing the imperialism and the war and the foreclosures and the exploitation. And if we just got rid of those particular capitalists, the world would be a better and happier place. Some people claim that they're against crony capitalism or corporatism and essentially put forth an analysis like this. The people in the system are bad, but the system itself isn't fundamentally flawed. This is usually then used to justify some insane right libertarian fantasy of deregulation and tax cuts, of course. So this second analysis, while less racist and anti-Semitic, is still basically the same as saying the raw shields control everything. It isn't a critique of the system of capitalism. The truth of the business is this. If you took out all the CEOs, the politicians the small business tyrants, and replace them with clones of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Eugene Debs, Rosa Luxemburg, and Jesus, the problems, unfair distribution of profits, exploitation, imperialism, so on and so forth, which are inherent to the capitalist system, would re eventually reassert themselves anyway. The people in the system aren't the root of the problems. The system itself is. Though, of course, those who are empowered by and who benefit from the capitalist system will go to great lengths to defend it. Also, even capitalism can't control the weather, by the way. It can alter it, but not in controllable ways. Of course, that's another episode. What the Luddites were protesting by smashing the machines was the whole structure of capitalism. It was a socialistic protest well before Marx created what we now consider the foundations of socialist theory, and while they weren't a union per se, 
their protest showed that a mass movement opposed to the injustices of the capitalist system was possible, even as capitalism was only in its early stages. The Luddites weren't the only labor movement in this time, though. So, in the early years of organized labor, trade unions and collective bargaining were both explicitly illegal. Organizing trade unions in the United Kingdom, for instance, could be punished by transportation or even execution. This didn't stop them from forming, though. Uh, this was because working conditions in early mills and other industrial facilities were almost universally intolerable. 14-hour days, uh, six or seven days a week, were the norm. That wages for unskilled workers were kept at a subsistence level, and more and more industrial production could be done by unskilled labor. As industrial capitalism grew out of mercantilism, it took all the worst bits of mercantilism, subsistence wages, oppression of workers, so on and so forth, and made these conditions applicable to larger and larger segments of the population. And uh, it's also important to remember that some of the other nasty bits of mercantilism hadn't gone away yet. Obviously, you know, Franklin is a fictional series in a fictional state, but in our real-world counterpart, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania abolished slavery in 1780, but the way it was abolished didn't help anyone who was already a slave, so the act effectively stated that anyone born to a slave after the act was passed, was a free man, but anyone who was a slave at the time the act was passed was still a slave for life. You know, big whoop. So there were still slaves, entirely legal slaves, in Pennsylvania until the 1840s. They numbered in the tens and not in the millions like in the South, but, you know, one slave is too many slaves. Indentured servitude was also still common into the 1820s. In fact, the practice expanded after the revolution in Pennsylvania. This depressed wages for free men, since, you know, you don't gotta pay indentured servants or slaves except in room and board. So, in the 1810s through the 1830s, the cause which the still illegal early labor unions rallied around was the 10-hour day. Six to six was the rallying cry. Ten hours work with one hour each for breakfast and lunch. Multiple large strikes in multiple cities had already been attempted to achieve this goal. And all had failed. Why did this happen? So, though we're talking about early, early, early unions here, before even their explicit legalization in 1842 in Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus Hunt. I think it's useful here to know about some forms that modern labor organization takes. So anyway, to find out more about unions, I went to unionfacts.com to find out some facts about unions. They say they have over 100 million facts about unions. Wow! Okay, let me find my union here. Oh, I guess they don't have facts on the IWW. Well, let me try this facts link here. Wow, unfair labor practices like mass picketing in such numbers that non-striking employees are physically barred from entering the plant. Gotta stand up for scabs' rights, am I right? Oh, wow, unions donate money to political campaigns? Incredible. By the way, I wonder where unionfacts.com gets its money from. Oh, they don't disclose who funds them. So maybe unionfacts.com isn't the best place to go for facts about unions, so I'll try and explain in this video instead. So I put some kinds of unions on a sort of political spectrum here from left to right. So on your left you have your radical, socialist, or anarchist, or syndicalist unions. This is stuff like the industrial workers of the world and stuff like that. You're organizing workers of all kinds, in all industries, of all skill levels, everywhere, into one big union. 
the uh, IWW wasn't formed until 1905, so we're well before that. But we're going to talk about some kind of primordial version of it fairly soon. These guys are taking it all the way to the point where the one big union is eventually supposed to provide social services and eventually supplant capitalism and the state through a general strike of all the workers. So effectively, the ultimate goal of the IWW is world domination. But it's world domination by the workers, so, you know, it's pretty good. Oh, and the IWW was also unique in its era for being militantly anti-racist in its organizing, which was, to say the least, an oddity in 1905. We'll talk a bit about that in a few minutes and much more later in the series. Uh, a little less left than that is industrial unionism, where everyone in a single industry is in the same union. So in this form, anyone from an unskilled laborer to the guy with three years special training and ten years experience on a CNC lathe or some other kind of specialized equipment is in the same union and the same bargaining unit even. Uh, you might have separate unions per industry or you might not. Uh, at the end of the day, the IWW's one big union is a subset of this idea. However, the uh, much less radical Congress of Industrial Organizations, or CIO, was primarily a federation of individual industrial unions up until its merger with the American Federation of Labor in 1955. Uh, a modern sort of industrial union is something like the uh, United Auto Workers, where all workers in an auto plant are under the same union umbrella and on the same contract. But what's most common today are craft unions. So uh, craft unions have a lot of problems. Uh, these unions are balkanized by craft or trade. So there's a sheet metal workers union, a carpenters union, a pipe fitters union, an operating engineers union, and so on. Skilled workers are usually the only ones capable of organizing these unions. And the premier craft union federation, the American Federation of Labor, or AFL, never had much interest in organizing unskilled workers. And uh, since the merger of the uh, AFL with the CIO in 1955, there are now hybrid industrial craft unions of unskilled workers. And by the way, unskilled is a hell of a loaded term. Retail workers in the year of our Lord 2018 have one of the hardest jobs out there. And uh, these sort of hybrid unions are usually the first experience most people have with unions. You know, a bastardized retail union in a grocery store or a rapidly declining department store where you're given a portion of your already insultingly low retail wages to union dues for a union that doesn't care about you unless you have seniority, and your union representative makes Cheryl and HR look like Big Bill Haywood himself. It puts a lot of people off unions early, to say the least. So craft unions have a lot of problems since multiple unions may be operating under multiple contracts under the same employer. One union may have a grievance with an employer and go on strike, while another union, on the same job, isn't on strike. Theoretically, no union would cross a picket line, but union members scabbing on other unions isn't exactly unheard of, especially where there's already jurisdictional conflicts to begin with. Multiple unions give employers, or capitalists, another method to sow divisions between workers. You know, they can divide them by trade or union local, as opposed to the more traditional method of putting workers against each other, racism. Oh, by the way, as an aside here, I haven't talked as much about race as I ought to have in this series, so most early trade unions did not allow people of color to join. So did a lot of late trade unions. Martin Luther King Jr. was making speeches to the AFL-CIO, asking for their support while large proportions of their affiliated unions were either segregated or straight up not open to people of color at all. 
you know, obviously he was speaking out against this. Uh, segregated unions are a problem. Many, many strikes were rendered ineffective when whites organized a union, which excluded blacks. So when the white union went on strike, non-union black workers kept on working. They weren't about to forego wages for the sake of the grievances of the whites-only union. This was a problem up to and including early socialist parties before a coherent philosophy of anti-racism took hold. And of course, racism continues to be a problem in organized labor to this day. I mean, wherever you are, you can probably go on to Google and find 50 articles accusing your local trade unions of being too damn white, male, straight, cis. And those articles are usually correct in those accusations. But a good portion of these same articles are probably also claiming that the solution to this is to abolish trade unions in favor of some anti-worker right-to-work bullshit that won't benefit anyone but the capitalists. The point here is that, you know, you can criticize how unions function without being anti-union. That's what I'm doing now. But uh, the thing is, the more important point is, you know, the capitalist class has used and continues to use racism to divide the working classes. If your socialism or your communism or your anarchism or your militant trade unionism isn't explicitly and overtly anti-racist, it's worthless at best and flat-out Strasserism at its worst. Uh, this also applies to sexism, by the way. A huge number of textile workers were women, working the same 14-hour days in the mills, under the same appalling conditions. They generally also weren't allowed in early trade unions. Oh, and don't forget that there were kids working in the mills, too. Until 1938. Yeah, 1938. Gene Kelly was on Broadway before they got the kids out of the mills. Yeah, Gene Kelly, noted union member and member of the board of directors of the Writers Guild of America, who personally protested the first hearing of the anti-communist House Committee on Un-American Activities, unlike that scab, Fred Astaire. So craft unions open the door for business unionism. This isn't a type of union so much as a philosophy for organizing a union. You run it like a business. The administration is hierarchical and only vaguely democratic, if it's democratic at all. Unlike radical industrial unionism, business unionism explicitly puts forth no kind of structural critique of capitalism and uh, uses strikes and direct action only to further their individual union's bargaining position with the employers without questioning the employer's ownership of the means of production. Business unions typically consider themselves apolitical. They don't really support legislative agendas to further social or economic uh, agendas, let alone radical changes to improve workers' lives in general. They oppose politicians who oppose unions, obviously, but they aren't about to endorse, say, Bernie Sanders over the oh-so-electable Hillary Clinton. The uh, union administration is usually a bureaucracy which is largely unaccountable to the rank and file and largely sees their members' success as directly tied to the company's success. So, like, the company can't pay higher wages if the company isn't successful, you know. So, in the United States, our most important unions are mostly business unions, organized under the umbrella of the AFL-CIO. They don't have much of a larger agenda focusing on social programs or fundamental changes to the capitalist system. They are political in so much as they support democratic politicians, but they rarely argue for, say, an end to imperialist wars, redistribution of wealth, universal health care, and so on. And, uh, this leads to a lot of perverse and bizarre situations. If your union can't conceive of a future beyond capitalism, your options are pretty limited. I'll give you a few examples. 
So one of the common problems with American infrastructure construction is its high price, and part of that is due to overstaffing required by union contracts. So while the first segment of the 2nd Avenue subway was being constructed at an enormous price for a tiny section of tunnel, more than a few articles uh, in the New York Times and elsewhere laid the blame at positions like oilers, elevator operators, standby electricians and plumbers, and other largely unnecessary staff for the uh, insane estimated cost plus the equally insane cost overruns. So why do these union contracts require these extra positions? So if your union cannot see beyond or does not wish to alter the existing capitalist system, the only way to protect workers is to protect jobs. To keep your union members employed, you need to make sure that as many people are on each job as possible, since, and especially in construction, work can be sporadic and unpredictable. So if I'm negotiating the contract, I gotta keep as many of my guys employed as possible, even if they're just an elevator operator who sits on a milk crate and pushes a button all day. It's the Luddite problem again, but with an absurd outcome, where rather than save labor with our labor-saving devices, we pay a guy to push an elevator button all day. Frankly, I'd rather pay him to sit at home and organize labor that could see beyond the capitalist system and effectively advocate for policies which protected the worker and not the job could achieve that. Uh, another bizarre outcome to business unionism can be seen in this year's uh, West Virginia Teachers Strike. So the American Federation of Teachers found themselves in a position where they were negotiating for better wages for teachers in opposition to politicians they had previously endorsed as a result of a strike which was explicitly illegal. And when they came out announcing they had made a deal... The rank and file rejected it and continued to strike against the wishes of both the government and the union leadership. The union administration can be completely blind to the actual conditions of workers. West Virginia teacher salaries were the 47th lowest in the nation, after all. This goes to show that even in business unions or craft unions, there are frequently radical factions demanding more democracy and more action on social and political issues. So in 1975, I organized a meeting between young radical students from the University of <laughs> and a radical faction of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters in Detroit, Michigan. The Teamsters organized a whole lot of folks, by the way, but you could kind of say they're the truck drivers' union. They're named Teamsters since they originated from a union of folks who manage teams of horses. You probably know a Teamster. He's your friendly local UPS guy. Or UPS gal. Or maybe your UPS driver is non-binary. I don't know. So on July 30th, we met in the Red Fox restaurant to discuss strategies to re-democratize the union which had only three short years prior endorsed Richard Nixon for president, and which was firmly under centralized control by Frank Fitzsimmons, and of course the Mafia. So of course we were surprised to see none other than former Teamsters president Jimmy Hoffa himself walk into the restaurant. He sat down at a table near ours at which former Teamsters and current mobsters Tony Giacalone and Tony Provenzano were seated. So it was an awkward situation, to say the least. As we talked in low whispers about reforming the union Hoffa once headed, the discussion at Hoffa's table became more and more heated. And then we heard a gun being cocked. The Tonys tried to march Hoffa past our table and out of the restaurant, but moments earlier, one of our group had spilled a glass of water on the floor, 
which both the Tonys slipped and fell on. So what had clearly been a hit had failed and the Tonys were out cold. Realizing we had inadvertently saved Hoffa's life, but that the mob would surely try again, we hustled him out of the restaurant into a car and smuggled him across the border to a safe house in Windsor at the foot of the Ambassador Bridge, where the mob didn't have as much reach. Three months passed while the public, the mob, and the police believed Hoffa had disappeared. One of our group leaked a false rumor to the Detroit Free Press that he had been killed and buried in Giant Stadium under Section 107. So, without a working television or meaningful contact with the outside world, slowly but surely the collection of Marxist literature in the safe house got to Hoffa, and he began to speak in politics we all understood. Uh, fearing discovery by the mob, and with Hoffa growing more and more open to leftist politics, I contacted some old friends in South America, and we managed to arrange to fly Hoffa to Argentina until the heat was off and he could return to the Teamsters to lead a more radically democratic union. Unfortunately, soon after he arrived in Argentina, President Isabel Perón was overthrown and a military junta installed by the United States. But through an intermediary, we were able to arrange Hoffa's safe passage to Havana via Sandinista-controlled territory in Nicaragua. However, U.S.-backed forces working on the part of the Somoza government intercepted the transport on the way to pick Hoffa up, and he was stranded in Nicaragua. The last we heard of him, he was fighting with the Sandinistas against U.S.-funded Contras. It was yet another blow against American labor, courtesy of Ronald Reagan. So that's what really happened to Jimmy Hoffa. Anyway, so worse than business unionism is a company union. This is a fake union set up by the company. R rather than the business union, which is only vaguely accountable to the rank and file, the company union is only accountable to the company. These are illegal, but they were common until the 1930s. One of the side effects of craft unions is unions accusing other unions of being company unions if they're seen to be too close to management. Which, you know, that's another fun way the capitalists have to uh, divide the working classes. Also notably not on here is professional associations. The American Institute of Architects, the National Society of Professional Engineers, the National Bar Association, and so on, are not trade unions. Professional associations exist to maintain the prestige and power associated with their profession, and they typically maintain this by ensuring there is a high barrier to entry to the profession. Uh, via examinations and state licensure, of course, but also by requiring increasingly expensive university degrees. Now, this is not to say that higher education is unnecessary to work in a professional job, of course, but if the financial barrier to entry to a professional position is higher than the educational barrier to entry, effectively this sort of credentialism becomes a barrier to the poor rather than to the incapable. Uh, and solidarity between professionals is not a factor in a professional organization. Both working professionals and their bosses are usually in the same association. So let's go back in time again. Uh, even back in the early 19th century, most of the still illegal unions were craft unions, which made worker solidarity difficult. No one had yet won concessions since no one strike had yet been big enough or involved enough craft unions to provoke the capitalist class into any action other than strike-breaking through force. Now, this was about to change, though. In 1834, in Philadelphia, Franklin, uh, a new union was formed, the General Trades Union, which tried something new. Rather than pursue more traditional craft unionism, they organized all skilled laborers and, crucially, also organized unskilled laborers. 
Before the General Trades Union organized any mass action, though, in May of 1835, coal heavers who unloaded coal barges on the Schuylkill, or whatever we want to call this river, uh, put, put, put names in the comments. We still haven't come up with names for the rivers. Uh, decided to walk off the job of their own abolition and strike for a 10-hour day. Uh, these folks weren't even organized by the General Trades Union yet. So within a few days of the coal heavers uh, going on strike, 20,000 other workers, from skilled tradesmen to city employees to just regular unskilled workers, had joined the strike. It became a genuine, bona fide, general strike, and the city shut down. The city relented on June 10th. Legislation was passed making a 10-hour, 6-to-6 workday the standard. The 10-hour workday, which was actually 12 hours long, had finally been won. Over the next several months, many more smaller strikes for better wages and assorted demands were carried out, and the General Trades Union was almost universally successful in getting workers' demands met. However, the success was short-lived. Many workers left the General Trades Union as soon as their demands were met, and they felt no more need to organize. And eventually, with uh, membership declining, the economic pressure from the Panic of 1837 ended the General Trades Union. But uh, its effects were widespread. Workers in dozens of other cities heard about the success of the General Trades Union strike, and they demanded and were awarded the 10-hour day that was actually 12 hours long. So, what's the takeaway here? Unions are the power base on which almost any kind of economic progress is built. Improvements in compensation, or reductions in hours without reduction in pay, must be taken by labor action. They will not be awarded to the workers by the capitalist class for good behavior. I mean, John Maynard Keynes said we'd be working 20-hour weeks by now, and look where we are instead. The gig economy has destroyed both minimum wage and the 8-hour day. A huge number of us work in spreadsheet mines and email farms for 60 hours a week without overtime. Wages have stagnated as productivity has increased since the 1980s, and uh, you guessed it, this correlates with Lower union membership. A correlation is not causation. Which is why we need a sustained struggle, not against some kind of nebulous crony capitalism, or corporatism, or the Rothschilds, or a multi ethnic, racially diverse group of greedy bankers I use to stand in for the Rothschilds because I'm not anti Semitic, but a sustained struggle against capitalism itself. To do this, we need unions which can see beyond the confines of capitalism and advocate for real social and economic progress. So uh, go join a union. Organize your workplace. If you don't know how to organize your workplace, ask for help from a union in your field. If you don't have unions in your field, go ask for help from the IWW. Go join the IWW. The only requirement is that you're not a boss. That is, you can't hire or fire anyone. Join the IWW. Unionize your workplace. Join the one big union. Organize. Just organize. Organize. One big union. Join the IWW. Domination. Okay, so it's the end of the episode. So this is the commercial. If you like the episode, please consider going to my Patreon and giving me a dollar. If you give me a dollar, you get bonus episodes once a month. If you don't want to contribute monthly, there's also a buy me a coffee link in the description where you can give me a one-time donation, but you don't get the bonus episodes. Uh, the next bonus episode is going to be on Killdozer, which was actually a zoning issue at its core. Though, obviously, I'm not going to only be talking about zoning because, you know, it's Killdozer. I haven't worked this out completely yet, but we're going to have t-shirts soon. Uh, this design is by Jeremy Hammond from 
the Ballin' Out Super Podcast, which is America's number one leftist anime podcast. It's Robert Moses with an anthropomorphous... Anthropomorphous... Anthropomorphosized highway. I'll have more details about the shirts when I actually figure out the specifics of how I'm going to order them, but in the meantime, go over there and give Ballin' Out Super a listen. Uh, follow me on the Twitter at do not eat one or if you don't like social networks that allow neo-nazis to join follow me on mastodon that's mastodon like the big elephant thing not mastodon like Macedonia at do not eat at mastodon.social okay now we're gonna do the cinematics